So uh, my topic is what to do about this exploded deleted uh, paperwork, and um, I think the, the question goes to uh, why it is that there is so much bureaucracy in our time around doing human experiments. So um, I think what I'll do is sort of trace the, um, the way that sensibilities about doing experiments in medicine have changed, um, and I'll start by talking about uh, Hippocratic medicine, ancient medicine, and kind of work through the period of the late 19th through the mid 20th century when um, attitudes about human experiments um, changed in such a way that they laid the foundation for modern human research ethics. And I'll end by talking about um, research and experiments with human beings in neuroscience and where some of the new issues are. So um, one of the striking features of the Hippocratic Oath and the Hippocratic Corpus uh, is that um, what we take to be so important these days, worrying about truth-telling and informed consent, um, are just not part of that tradition. The other striking thing um, that takes us a little, a little bit out of clinical medicine into the area of human experiments is that there's hardly any mention of experimentation except very indirectly in the Hi in Hippocratic writings. Um, and case, there is a remark in a book called Epidemics, um, which is commonly attributed to, to Hippocrates, or the Hippocratic writers, where um, the physician is counseled to be bold in an emergency, which people have taken to be um, support for the notion that if necessary, if, if all else fails, um, you should feel free to innovate or to experiment. Um, at the same time, Epidemics also counsels not to do harm, to think first about minimizing risk. And obviously those goals to, to, to minimize harms and yet to do something that you might not have done before because your standard approaches have failed um, are somewhat in tension. Um, there's no question but that people had the idea for thousands of years of doing what we would today call controlled experiments. Uh, we even know that in ancient Chinese medicine um, emperors would send people out into the field to uh, compare different treatments, uh, herbal treatments and others for, for disease. But um, for the most part, these, uh, these experiments were, were what, what are commonly described as empirical rather than science-based. Um, and to bring these experiments up through the Middle Ages and uh, uh, post-Enlightenment uh, era, um, there were many experiments with vaccination uh, in the 19th century. Um, of course, toward the end of the 19th century, in the 1870s on, there's also a lot of activity in what uh, comes to be experimental biology, particularly in Europe. So you have the development of germ theory, you have lots of experiments that involve electricity, some of them involving uh, neurosurgical patients where well, their skulls are uh, uh, exposed. Um, and so people are beginning to get the idea that there's a, that there's a potential for a, a conceptual scheme, a theoretical system, um, that could form the basis of a science of medicine and biology, from which you can infer hypotheses that you could test. Um, so all these the sort of cultural changes, notions of, uh, of specific human rights, even in the context of medicine, um, the idea of of science and experimental science and uh, of, of theoretical systems are all kind of beginning to merge around the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. The signal event um, that uh, um, really impressed people uh, around the 20, turn of the 19th 20th centuries was some famous experiments that uh, the Army doctor, U.S. Army doctor Walter Reed did involving yellow fever in Cuba. Um, without getting into a lot of detail about that, it's a well-documented, fascinating story, uh, Walter Reed not only figured out uh, what the vector of yellow fever is, it turns out it's a mosquito, nobody had ever nailed that down before, he also um, did something that was really quite innovative, and people don't know why he did this. Uh, he actually had a contract that he had his volunteers for his experiments uh, on yellow fever sign, and these, these volunteers included uh, local Spanish men who had immigrated, some of them just getting off the boat, literally, from Spain to work in Cuba, and also a, uh, a cadre of American soldiers. Um, 
and we know that a number of these people were asked to sign one page. We would call them perhaps consent forms. They were contracts. Um, and as, as in some respects, they weren't bad. We would probably object to the fact that they were paid uh, to be in this pretty well, actually, $200 in, in gold to be in these experiments. But what's important is that, they just, that by, by, the, by ni around 1900, these ideas of, of a kind of science-based experiments, more or less, they were still pretty empirical. But they had an idea that there was a vector, a public health uh, angle. Um, and the idea of rights, and the idea that um, there were people who were doing unconsented experiments, as we today call them, that were getting bad publicity at that time. I'm not sure exactly why it happened, but it looks as though Walter Reed and the Army Surgeon General decided they were going to have a contract for their volunteers. Uh, Walter Reed becomes a great hero. Um, there's actually a, a Broadway show called Yellow Jack about the great Walter Reed, partly because um, an urban legend developed that Reed himself had taken the bite from the mosquito and died a few years later from yellow fever. He did die a few years later, but not because of yellow fever. Um, in fact, uh, Walter Reed never took the bite. He was considered too old to be part of the experiment, but he became a kind of culture hero. This uh, gave a great publicity for medicine, for public health experiments, for for um, um, for the for the U.S. Army that had done a very ethical uh, experiment. Um, through the teens and twenties, um, gradually as a, there's a kind of there's a growth in the interest in doing systematic experiments. Uh, sometimes there are scandals about these experiments, particularly if they involve children, both in the U.S. and in, in Europe. But for the most part, um, because doctors and their patients are pretty much isolated from anybody else, still before 1950 or so, um, and because, interestingly, just about anybody who a doctor touches is considered a patient, whether they're sick or not, the word patient is very ambiguous in this period. Um, we don't have this distinction between a patient and a research volunteer or a research subject as clearly as we do today. Um, but for the most part, people are willing to accept the idea that doctors can do experiments as they see fit. It begins to change Historians dispute this, perhaps some, to some extent because of the influence of the Nazi doctors' trial after the Second World War and the notorious concentration camp experiments. More notorious now, really, than even at the time when they were first revealed. Um, but uh, in the course of, of that trial, the second trial in at Nuremberg, uh, Germany, after the Second World War, uh, seven uh, medical doctors and bureaucrats were hanged uh, because of... Uh, what were, in fact, uh, not so much violations of, of rules on experiments, because the court concluded there weren't really good rules on human experiments at that time, um, but rather because they had been uh, involved in, in, in deaths, in murders, in the course of doing these experiments. It's important to remember, without going into detail in this couple of minutes, that from the late 50s to the late 60s, there is a sea change in attitudes about patients' rights in general. I said that that was happening starting the late 19th century, really comes to fruition in the 1960s with civil rights movements. And um, that also bleeds over into uh, human research ethics. Um, as people uh, viewing this video know, in the, in the later 60s, the early 70s, there was a series of uh, incidents around human research, um, the most famous of which is the syphilis study scandal uh, that, that uh, is known as the, as the Tuskegee syphilis study. Um, and that revelation of what was actually a very public study that had gone on for 40 years in the U.S. Public Health Service, that revelation in the New York Times um, caught the attention of Congress uh, because this was, of course, uh, uh, just the period at which the Civil Rights Movement had crested, uh, early 1970s, and um, the fact that this had happened in full view with U.S. Public Health Service and local participation involving poor African American men uh, for decades. Uh, without their informed consent, um, exposing sex partners, wives, and lovers to this disease. We don't even know exactly who was exposed to it in the course of this four-decade experience. Um, all this attracted a lot of attention and resulted in the first human research ethics rules, ultimately ten years later in the early 80s in the United States, uh, or the first, I should say, comprehensive rules uh, that, in theory, uh, known as the common rule, cover all U.S. government departments that do uh, human experiments or that conduct or fund human experiments. Um, 
Now, of course, an unfortunate part of this history in answering the title question for this talk is, you know, why all the paperwork? Um, the unfortunate aspect of it is that there are some bad things that were done. Um, some of them were, uh, were, were things that were done that should have been known that were wrong at the time. And there are other examples that I could give. Um, but in fairness, our conventions have changed. And, and it's easy to uh, make moral judgments in retrospect, but it's actually hazardous to do that. Um, so the reality is that many of the, the, the current regulatory regime that does involve a lot of paperwork did in fact emerge from some really, some what we would think now in retrospect were things that were really wrong, that were at least morally wrong, if not overtly harmful, and in some cases were, did actually cause harm. Um, but the system is not designed to uh, catch people in criminal acts. The research regulatory system is designed to help people who want to do the right thing understand what the expectations are, the expectations of the law, the expectations of the medical establishment, the expectations of society generally. Um, if people want to cheat, they can cheat. Uh, and, and, but, and the regulatory system is not really designed to catch people who intentionally want to cheat. Um, but it is, again, designed to give guidance to people who really aren't sure what the conventions are right now and want to be, want to be careful. Um, and the fact is that the, the rules for human research right now are very detailed, and the expectations in the, in the medical community uh, are rather specific, and they're not just a matter of common sense. So that's why we worry about making sure that people have, and I'm myself am subject to this when I have to get renewed for approval to do uh, survey research as a bioethicist. Um, we have to take these exams periodically to make sure we're on top of what's going on in the system. And I have to fill out the same forms that people viewing this video are someday going to have to fill out if they haven't already. So since this is a neurocollaborative, let me end with just um, a few remarks about how this comes up in, in neuroscience. And some of you know, uh, for example, that one of the concerns is that data uh, appears in, in neuroimaging experiments, information comes up that people hadn't anticipated. And so one of the interesting questions right now is, should consent forms be designed uh, in such a way that they inform people that although you're a normal volunteer, we might see something in your neuro, neuro scan that raises some questions, and we may suggest that you see your doctor about this. And how, how is that appropriate if the person who's looking at the image is not even an MD, but perhaps a God forbid, a philosopher, uh, um, how, what kinds of preparation, what kinds of consent are required when you're taking normal volunteers into a neuroimaging study? That's one very interesting discussion that people have had recently. Um, and then, of course, there are experiments that involve people who are ill. Um, so um, just to take one instance of a rather new technology that I've been interested in, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, TMS is, has been approved for a few years by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration um, as a, uh, a second-line therapy for people who have major depressive disorder, as an alternative for people who have failed uh, uh, electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, Transcranial magnetic stimulation is now approved for those people. But it's also being used in, in many experiments, uh, some well-controlled, maybe some not so well-controlled, for lots of other disorders like schizophrenia. It's also uh, being considered for enhancement technologies. And here again, you'd probably go back to normal volunteers, so people who have, uh, have, who have normal intellectual ability, um, who we might want to see if a little zapping at the right time could keep them more alert. There's uh, talk uh, about um, helping soldiers learn more efficiently uh, using transcranial back stimulation at critical times when they're, uh, when they're learning a new task. So we're into, we're into an era now, as, as everybody watching this knows, of a lot of, of, of science-based experiments that involve the brain. Um, we're trying to apply the lessons we've learned in the history of human research ethics to these, these new experiments. And you know, because the brain is such a complex organ and because of the, of the symbolism around the brain and its popular identification with who we are, with our personal identity, um, there's a, a, a especially in, um, intense concern about how experiments are done uh, and, and 
um, and, the, and the justification for doing those experiments. Um, at the same time, um, there are also new new ways of your, if you're sick of getting access to experimental drugs or experimental devices. So we have a very interesting pull, which we're going to see in neuroscience research too, in our in our research regime between um, protection, which is mostly what our his, the history I've talked about has been about. It's about protecting people from unscrupulous, very much the minority, but unscrupulous investigators or or people who are just haven't thought through their protocols very carefully. But the other side of that is increasingly as science gets better, people want to benefit from science, uh, particularly if they have no good alternatives. There are these new alternative ways of getting access to, uh, to drugs or devices uh, that are not part of, of a, an experiment into which you might be randomized. Mm -hmm. So we have this interesting tension, which I think we'll see in neuroscience also in the next few years, between protection and access, particularly for people who are ill. For the rest of us, um, we're going to be taking more pills. Uh, we're going to be uh, zapping ourselves to stay awake and alert, perhaps even through videos like this. Um, I will look forward to the rest of the discussion in the Neurocollaborative, whether with the, uh, with the assistance of, uh, of modafinil and transcranial max stimulation or otherwise. Thanks.